Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Thank you, Teresa. It's show number 51, uh-huh. and we just left off last time. Uh, I think we finished up talking about the Jesuits uh, trying to help out with the, the flatheads. So yes. Where where are we going today? We are going on the opposite side of the world. Okay. Yeah, um, we're going to be looking at Germans. Oh, great. And okay. Them coming to America, and this is one of those cases where something that happens way over in Europe, no one's expecting anything. That it, it, something happens, and then there are consequences to that that have incredible consequences that ultimately. Uh, affect us. Okay. And so what we're going to be looking at is the populating of the Midwest by German immigrants. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit about this before, but this time around we're going to be looking at it from how a treaty in 1815 caused all of this to happen. All of this to happen. Okay. And the treaty is the Treaty of Vienna. And it was a redrawing of the map of Europe after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. And the idea was to give some of the smaller countries land that would be close to France so that if France became aggressive again, these smaller countries would all unite and stop France before she got underway, like she did last time. And so one of those smaller countries was still a very powerful Prussia. Mm -hmm. And they gave Prussia much of what's called Westphalia and the Rhineland that's land, well, Rhineland, it's on the Rhine, Rhine River in Westphalia in that same area, and then also part of Pomerania, which is further north along the North Sea. From the very beginning, that was not a very good move politically or culturally. And the reason was is that Westphalia was a heavily Catholic part of Germany. A lot of mm-hmm. Catholics there. Especially if it's the the center in the city uh, and the diocese of Münster. The Rhineland was also very Catholic, and especially around the archdiocese of Cologne. Prussia is Protestant. Okay. And had very little uh, sensitivity to Catholic issues. The leaders, the the, uh, royal family of Prussia, the Hohenzollerns, uh, themselves were very Protestant, and they were very suspicious of foreign ties, any kind of foreign ties. Well, Catholics are tied to Rome, and so that made them very suspicious. And the Prussians usually played on their suspicions and had secret police and oppressive measures and jails full and all that kind of stuff. The people in this region had been scratching out a living with crops, uh, some livestock, and then on the side, they were involved in linen weaving. So there was flax that was growing mm-hmm. there, and then they would make linen out of that. And in the summer of, of 1830, it turned out to be a very cool and damp summer. And so very little flax grew and therefore could not be weaved. Therefore, no linen was made. And so it, these were very tough times for the people of Westphalia. So now you've got an economic thing going on, and you've got a religious thing going on. And the religious tensions and the bad economics joined together with this political suffocation. Uh-huh. And then just on the other side of the border, you have the French Revolution of 1830. And some of the people are sympathetic to what's happening over in France. And that, of course, is uh, going to be... Another thing to bring in more spies right. and people are going to be, especially at the universities, they're going in town halls, they're going to have spies there, people being arrested, all of that. And now at the same time that's happening, the letters that, if you remember Gottfried Duden, mm, uh, the yeah. fellow mm-hmm. had settled in, in Krakow, right. uh, Missouri, uh, those letters are now being published. And so people are reading about how wonderful things are. In America, especially in you know, this rich land on the Missouri River, you know, the St. Charles County area, you've got religious tolerance, there's lots of Catholics there. This is freedom, the whole works, this is just paradise. And then included in his letters is a how to do it. You know, this is how you 
get permission to leave your country, which a lot of monarchs were more than happy to have. There's so-called surplus population leave. Right. These are the ports you need to go to. These are the ships you need to take. This is where you need the land in, in America. This is how you get from there to here. It was very simple. And so this triggers emigration from Westphalia, from the Rhineland, from Hanover, and from Bavaria. And then the, the next question is why St. Louis, not just because of Duden and the Missouri River Valley, and then also from St. Louis south down to, to Perry County. And one of the reasons for that, I, I think, that makes so much sense is something that Father Barnaby Faraday had talked about in his book, The St. Louis German Catholics. Mm -hmm. He published it in 2004. And what he pointed out was that unlike most of the United States, the St. Louis area, and especially the diocese, was rich with German-speaking clergy, unlike other parts. Uh, Father Faraday points out that in all of New England, there was only one priest who could speak German. Wow. And besides that, the land was rocky and it was full of Puritan types who were not <laughs> particularly friendly to Catholics, and so why would a Catholic want to go there? What about Boston? Now, this is before the Irish came and turned Boston into a Catholic city. Right. Okay. They looked around, and they found in Boston that there were only 60 or so families with German surnames. So not all that much to begin with. In the entire diocese, there was only one priest who could service their needs. In all of New York, there were only two German-speaking priests. In Baltimore, two German-speaking priests. Wow. Philadelphia, one. Even Cincinnati, which would become part of the big German triangle, at that point only had two. Wow. And in Detroit, only one. Now, here's St. Louis, and Father Faraday points this out. In St. Louis, there were three German-speaking priests at the cathedral alone. Mass was offered every Sunday with a German sermon. And, of course, confessions could be heard. In St. Genevieve, you've got Father Francis Xavier Dahlman, who spoke French, German, and English. There was a town in Missouri called Westphalia, mm -hmm. uh, which was served, serviced by a, a German priest. The Jesuits at St. Louis University, many of them could function in German, and they served the German Catholic communities that were now farming in Florissant as well as in St. Charles. You know? Uh, a couple years later, Bishop Rosati would write to the Leopoldine Society and remark that in the Diocese of St. Louis, there were 18 priests who could speak German. Eighteen. Wow. I mean, that's like the whole rest of the United States added up and still a couple more. Exactly. You know? He also would mention a couple years later that the two schools were being opened in St. Louis, specifically where German language was being used. So uh, a girls' school and a boys' school. So by the mid-1830s, small German communities began popping up all over the place when these immigrants began arriving. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty haphazard at first. It was, this is not an organized effort. Okay, it's pretty haphazard. An uh, example of that in 1836, there's a, a Father Francis Regis Loisel, and he was assigned to Cahokia. But when he found that there was a newly established German community there in Belleville, and in Milstadt, he wrote back to Bishop Rosati asking for help. Well, fortunately, it just so happens that among the immigrants arriving was a Father Charles Meyer from Switzerland. And he was staying with relatives in Belleville. So Father Meyer was then incarnated into the Diocese of St. Louis, given jurisdiction over all the German Catholics that could be found in western Illinois. Wow. So he had quite a circuit. So besides Belleville and Milstadt, he also found German communities in a town called Teutonia, mm -hmm. which was later changed to uh, Paderborn, oh, okay. Illinois, as well as in Shiloh. Further south, uh, there's a little settl settlement of people in what becomes known as Liberi, St. Laborius there. And it's called that because most of the people had come from the German city of Paderborn in Germany which the patron saint of Potterborn is St. Laborious. And then later, other Germans are going to go to Shoal Creek, which is now Germantown, and they're going to be petitioning for a resident priest also. 
one individual who plays a very important role in all of this because the reality is, and, and we've, we've heard this any number of times, that if you don't have priests, you don't have Eucharist. If you don't have Eucharist, you don't have the Catholic community. Right. It, it falls away. And there are rare exceptions to that, but that's the vast majority. So uh, here we find that there is a seminarian who migrates to the United States, comes to St. Louis, ends up down at St. Mary's in the Barrens. So he's going to be bilingual. He'll be a German. That's where he's, he's born in, in Paderborn itself. But, of course, he's going to be uh, schooled in English. Mm -hmm. His name is Gasper Henry Ostlangersberg. At the age of 23, he makes his way to America, enrolls as a seminarian at St. Mary's, and he's just getting ready for ordination when all of a sudden they found out that there was a complication involved. Oh, no. Um, what happened was that when he left Westphalia, 23 years old, he had not served in the military in the Prussian army, which was compulsory conscription, and therefore the Berlin government had forced the bishops not to issue demissorial letters to anyone who was they considered to be a draft dodger. So as a result of that, Oslangenberg could not be ordained. And Bishop Rosati was, was beside himself because he needed this priest. That's you know? right. And so what he did was um, the bishop then wrote to Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, explaining what had happened and the Pope ended up giving a dispensation for this and, and it granted an exception. This was in 1835. Interestingly enough and inexplicably, you've got this man that's bilingual, uh -huh. okay? You need him, okay? That's really... And so what happens is he gets assigned to the cathedral. Oh, no, yeah. okay. So oh, Father Oslangenberg <laughs> ends up in the, in the cathedral, and it was... Their intention eventually to go ahead, after he had had some pastoral experience then, to send him to South St. Louis because uh, he was not only fluent in English now and in German, but also he picked up French. Okay. So he's a pretty valuable wow. guy. Uh -huh. Instead, Bishop Rosati receives this letter from the people at, at Liberty, and so he then sends Father Oslangenberg to Liberty and from there to various other missions to take care of the people there in western Illinois. Okay. The people were enthusiastic, but the conditions were rough. And this is a man who is from a wealthy family in Paderborn. He, like so many others that we've seen, are, are used to uh, luxurious living, mm -hmm. and they've really come out to the mission territories. Probably beautiful churches over there. Oh, yeah, and you can visit them today, those big, beautiful churches. In the case of Father Oslangenberg, he ends up at St. Liberty, and the people are very enthusiastic, and they put up a little small log church for him. And he writes back to the bishop, and he says, you know, that's very nice, but there's no bell, there's no baptismal fount, and I'm living in the sacristy. Meanwhile, around 60 families in Germantown in Illinois send a petition to Bishop Rosati asking for a church and a priest. And they went even further. They said, we want Father Oslangenberg. <laughs> <laughs> so, naming who they want. Yeah, naming who they want. Well, uh, Bishop Rosati receives the letter. It's in German, and he doesn't read German. Uh -huh. So he hands it off to one of the other priests that's in the cathedral who does speak German. This is Father Joseph Lutz, and Father Lutz does translate the letter for him, but he leaves out the request for Father Oslangenberg, maybe because he thought it was inappropriate, or I don't mm -hmm. know why, but he did. And so uh, another priest was sent to Germantown, which is actually had a much nicer church and residence, and poor Father Oslangenberg finds himself staying at St. Liberty, and then given the assignment to take care of the German communities in Fayetteville and in Belleville, working pretty hard. So that way, Oslangenberg was, or the, the other priest was? No, Oslangenberg. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So he certainly had his hands full with yeah. a lot of work, but does tremendous work, as we're going to see with so many of these priests that just give themselves, they just pour themselves out for the people. That's good, hardworking German. Yes, yeah, right. Later, he's going to be transferred again, 
and this is going to be to a different part of Missouri that he had never experienced before. It's north up around Salt River. This is in the northern part of the state. And there he replaced Father Lefebvre, who had a huge amount of work to do. And he was there uh, on Salt River for a while until his health failed him. And so then he was transferred to Galena, where he was able to recover. And, and then from there, in 1843, when the Diocese of Chicago was established, he then went with the Diocese of Chicago and okay. became a priest there. You know, we have a, a letter from Father Brute. He says the following concerning Vincennes and what he was facing. He says, and I quote here, How I tremble to think of this situation I hear nothing spoken about except the immigrants and the cry for priests that goes up from every side. But here you have Bishop Rosati, who is just very, very fortunate to have as many German-speaking priests as he does. He has, right. Yeah. Right. But obviously the numbers were pretty substantial that were needing more. Yeah, because you have hundreds and hundreds of immigrants arriving every couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know where are you going to find uh, people for them? Another area that begins to really attract lots of Germans, too, is in, in Quincy, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one out of every two Catholics in Quincy at the time were German. Wow, I didn't realize there were that many. I knew there was a strong German population in Quincy, but I didn't realize there was that much. 50% yeah, of all the Catholics in Quincy, Quincy is a pretty Catholic town, 50% of them were Germans. Wow. Here again, Bishop Rosati is very lucky because when the people came over, they came over, these are Hanoverians, they mm -hmm. came over from northern Germany, Hanover, and they brought with them their priest. And this is a remarkable man, especially because of the, the torments that, that he underwent. The Germans wanted their priests, but they didn't give them a pass. They, they were really <laughs> rough on them. And this man's name is Father Augustus Florentinus Brichtweda. He was a priest of the Diocese of Osnabrück. He had received a classical education. He studied at the University of Bonn, University of Munich. He was a young priest who was inspired by the stories of German immigrants coming to America. And so he was able to convince his bishop to send him with a, a group that were moving, these Hanoverians, that were moving over to Quincy. And his bishop gave him demissorial letters so that he could be incarnated into the Diocese of St. Louis. He arrived in St. Louis, and immediately Bishop Rosati sent him up to Quincy. And he arrives in Quincy, and things are just meager as can be. I mean, these immigrants have just arrived themselves. They don't have anything. He sets up a parish with 170 members and announces the first Mass, and 15 people came. In the first four months, there were only two baptisms and four funerals. Wow. So, you know, you have people clamoring for a priest. The priest comes, and then nothing, you know. Well, he's undaunted. Okay. And so what he does is uh, Father Brickfitty then sets up a school, and this is in April of 1839. He founds a school, and 14 boys and 10 girls come to his school, enroll, and he begins teaching them. We believe this might be the first parochial school established by a Catholic priest in the United States. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm not sure of that, but, uh -huh. but it's it speculated that that might be. Progress was slow, a few more children coming, but Father Brickwitty was very patient. He's also a very holy man. In May of 1839, he received a donation of land on 7th Street in Quincy, and there begins building a church. He didn't have any money, and so he solicits from his parishioners donations, and they donated brick to the church as well as stone for its foundation. Things are coming along because now the people want to build a stone brick church, and they're going to do it themselves. And so, short of money, they do have plenty of volunteers, and they begin building the church itself, especially during the winter time, because these are farmers, and they're working all spring, summer, and fall, and so in the winter, they're less busy. And so they gathered into groups, and they would cut timber, 
and then they would slice the timber, making wooden shingles out of it for the roof, and eventually you have then the establishment of St. Boniface Church. It's not going to be consecrated until 1848, and by that time, Quincy was part of the Diocese of Chicago. By now, some of the parishioners had turned against their pastor. And we see this time and time again, for whatever reason, they just made life impossible for this man who had given over 10 years of his life to those people. And they just hounded him out of the city. He left the the city itself. This is a man who, up until two years before he left, he didn't even live in a rectory. There was no house for him. He was living in the sacristy. He drew no income. He never asked for a salary. He lived off of the money from his family that they had sent from Germany. Wow. You know, the bishop of Chicago was so upset with the way he was treated. This was Bishop Vander Velde. He actually closed the parish and transferred Father Brickfitty uh, down to uh, the town of Libri. He became the pastor of, of St. Labore. And there the people treated him with great kindness. So the last years of his life were very nicely uh, appreciated. He would die on November 21st of 1865 in Belleville. He visited St. Louis and he was on his way back down to St. Liberty and died on the way there. The people at St. Liberty found out about this, brought his body back to their village for burial. By this time, he was buried next to a fine brick church that he had had built for them 16 years earlier. And that church is still there today. It's a neat little town. Liberty is a beautiful little town. And the one thing that it has going for it, besides the church, is it's got a wonderful meat market. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. Great butcher shop. It's old-fashioned. You walk into it, and you just smell the sausages. It's I don't even know where that is. Where in it relation is, to you would go over to the east side from South St. Louis, okay. um, in South County, and then go down. I believe Highway Three. Okay. It's down in that area. Okay. But it's a it'd be a wonderful day trip for somebody. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. So anyway, something to keep in mind. This is the summation of the life of Father Brick DeWitty that Father. Rothensteiner has. Oh, okay. okay. And this is a quote from his first volume of the History of the Archdiocese. He said, Many hardships the good father had undergone in his missionary life, many good and even heroic deeds he had done for God's honor and for the welfare of the poor and the sorrowing. Many a disappointment and many a reproach and contradiction he had borne with patience from those he had never harmed. Therefore, his name is still a benediction, and his life, though closed, is still a power for good in the places once blessed by his presence. His was a worthy walk in the footsteps of Father Marquette. Oh, Isn't that nice. Beautiful? Very nice. Yeah. A man that almost none of us know. You right. Know, but as, as we go through this local church history, people, priests, nuns, laity, pop up as being these really incredible people whose names should be remembered. Absolutely, for all the offerings that they did for the community. Yeah. Father Augustus Florentinus Brichtwitte. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Monsignor. Sure. I love that. Love that look at Quincy. Uh, as yeah. That's where my, my family hails from yeah, originally. That's right, yeah. So. All right. Well, shall we close with a prayer and your blessing? Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and, and the of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Thank you so much, Monsignor. Okay. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.